Some of you might know Mariana Castillo de Bal's work, others do not. So I would like to shortly introduce um, Mariana Castillo de Bal. She was born in Mexico City and is living since several years in Berlin. As an artist, she had been awarded internationally with re-owned prizes. I just mentioned the prize of the National Gallery in Berlin in 2013 or the Zurich Art Prize in 2012. Um, she participated in many major exhibition and biennial. Some of the works you will see are, have been part of the Shasha Biennial, the Berlin Biennial, Documenta 13 in Kassel in 2012, or the Venice Biennial, um, where we also have work on view. Her most recent solo exhibition include presentations at Modern Art in Oxford, that was last year, Museum Monash University Museum of Art in Melbourne, and also the new museum in New York, both have been staged in 2019. She's also teaching here in the region. She's uh, since 2015. She's a professor of sculpture at the Kunstakademie in Münster. Um, so um, even living in Berlin, she's also connected um, with North Rhine-Westphalia. Um, museum as such and archives and objects stored in collection fascinating Mariana Castillo de Bal in her work. And museums are places um, where she is most interested in encountering things that are strange or seem strange, that are sometimes uncomfortable, um, uncomfortable objects. That means these are objects which are um, open still for imaginations, for interpretation and um, also objects that maybe also haven't been discovered uh, in total and also have the, the, the meaning of being activated or restaged or reinterpreted. In her artistic work, um, Castillo de Bal follows their stories in order to gain a new perspective and a deeper understanding of culture, temporal and also spatial context. And she also questions the museum um, narrative as such that always overlies the objects. Uh, so she researches in libraries, archives, she seeks corporations um, with other uh, scientists. And um, she also uses methods of archeology, span ethnography and historical research. Uh, there's a wide range of medium are used. You will see that in, in our presentation. There's installation, sculpture, video, photographs, printing and publications are very important media. And through that, um, she developed over the last 20 years her own personal artistic language, um, which tries to visualize certain moments in cultural history and enables us the visitors, the, the viewers to experience sometimes our alienation from things and um, she has been examining. So what is interesting from a museum perspective is that uh, Mariana Castillo Bal imagines a museum that permits different readings of cultural knowledge. And she reveals, you will see and discover that um, throughout the walk, through the exhibitions, uh, fresh connecting threads between objects. And that from a present perspective, but also um, focusing the past. The exhibition at um, our museum, MGK Siegen, is the first solo presentation um, of Mariana's work in Germany, uh, covering the complete oeuvre. We are showing works from the last 15 years, presenting in 14 rooms um, over about 1,000 square meters. And among them are many current installations, newly adapted or even newly produced for the Siegen exhibition. So the works we're showing uh, in a minute are ranging from um, the very known, also shown at the, at the 
um, Hamburger Bahnhof, the Nuremberg map of Tenochtitlan from 2013, so seven years old, a large installation of um, a wooden pavement um, engraved um, and showing the first European map of the Aztec uh, capital Tenochtitlan and uh, of course focusing the colonial history of Mexico to a new work uh, developed in Australia for an exhibition called Once I Thought the World Was Somewhere Else from 2021, uh, which is a layer um, and, and a multi-layered immersive textile diorama um, taking over the space uh, through large scale color photographs. And the theme or the, the idea of that installation is the exploration of the Idiakaran fossils, um, multicellular fossils um, discovered in, in South Australia. The region is also called Idiakaran Hills in South Australia. There's also focus on installations uh, revealing a direct reference to the venue in Siegen. Um, which we can partly give an insight to. Um, there's a loan from the Siegerland Museum in Etching, Battle of the Amazons by Lukas Forstermann after Peter Paul Rubens from um, 1623, which is based on the original painting of Rubens uh, of the same year. And also still in development, we can speak about it maybe at the end of this talk, um, is a new work in reference to the silver and the Taufschale to Siegen, the silver baptism bowl of Siegen, which was given by Prince Johann Moritz, Moritz um, of Nassau Siegen um, to the local church, the Nikolai Kirche. And that's an interesting object because it relates to colonial trade history of the 17th century and traveled from Peru to Brazil, to Africa, to Brazil, and back uh, or the first time to Europe, which was then um, dedicated as a kind of baptism bowl and uh, until now used um, in the church as such. Um, Mariana is, is with us already and um, a warm welcome to you as well. Um, Maybe we enter to the exhibition before I start the presentation, um, speaking about the title of the show, Amaranthus. Um, in, in process or in development of this exhibition, um, in an early concept of yours, um, we always deal with the idea of Andre Malraux, the politician and author uh, who wrote that famous essay, Museum Without Walls or the Imagine, uh, Imaginary Museum in, in 1947, which considered an kind of a world-wide um, collection based on, on replicas and, and, and copies to bring works from all over the continents together in one place. Uh, I know that was a very fascinating idea also um, in regards to your approach and uh, the way you work. Um, but we decided differently and Amaranthus also carries on that kind of idea, but in a different and maybe also open way. Yeah, hi, welcome. Thank you, Thomas, for the introduction. Um, yeah, I can, I can start with a a small story about where the title comes from. Uh, Amaranthus, as we all know, is uh, a plant that is uh, used for different purposes. It's used as a, for food and also as a flower, as an ornament. And in Greek, it means the flower that never dies. And somehow this idea uh, fitted somehow in the way I approach the history of objects, especially the objects which are now in museum collections or in research institutes. Uh, there are objects which are out of context. They were taken out of their original places or original um, context. 
And now they are somehow dead because they are kept in very extraordinary conditions. But still, uh, through my work, I try to recover their stories and I try to recover the story of, the, of these uh, flowers that never die, to recover their beauty and their, their spirits. Uh, it also has to do with the fact that amaranthus uh, is a plant that is also widely eaten in, in Mesoamerica and in Mexico, and especially in the pre-Hispanic times, it was uh, used to make uh, a series of figures. There were mainly uh, replicas of different deities or religious or sacred elements. And they were also eaten in these rituals. So it had also an aspect of uh, digesting these icons or digesting these figures and integrating them into our metabolism. So this is also that it's important for me, the way we actually assimilate all these uh, different aspects, not just in a discursive way, but also in terms of the materiality or the way the objects are being fabricated, reproduced, understood, and uh, stayed close to us. Great, maybe I'm starting now the presentation. So we all give you an insight into the exhibition. Seems should be full screen now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's an overview about our flow, floor plan and um, how the different works we're speaking about um, are spread over, over our second um, floor. We start the walkthrough or we speak about the work of Mariana by walkthrough the exhibition. We won't be able to mention um, any of the works um, because there's just too much and too much stories um, behind, but you will nevertheless um, see more of the works. And um, that is uh, just the overview of the parkour we kind of uh, following. So you give, you get an, in, in uh, kind of an orientation, especially if you know the spaces, you will recognize also the images. Yeah, starting, with the first space, um, there's a series of three columns made out of ceramic with the titles mechanical column, rhomboid or snake. And there's two questions um, that have been, yeah, the source or maybe the starting point for this project. Um, as they are, how to tell the story of the universe in a hundred years, how to tell the story of a universe in one day. And it's interesting because it's a piece that has been developed already with a group of people, which is kind of typical for Mariana's approach as a relationship to potters in Osaka in Mexico. And um, they try to exercise um, and to develop a story through a formal and uh, technical uh, approach, but also dealing um, with the collection, the archaeological museum, Rufino Tamayo, and uh, some of the pieces that uh, are collected um, by that museum. Uh, but Mariana, in your words, how that developed and how you connected to this group of potters and uh, how this developed um, because we are seeing um, here like gear wheels, uh, but also reference uh, to the endless column of Brancusi. Um, so there's a wide range of formal references. So maybe you can explain um, how they came together and uh, how this project developed. Um, yeah. Yeah, we started uh, with a, a small workshop 
together with the Taller Cuatlicue, which is based in Atzompa in Oaxaca, and also the collective 2015. And um, we started to collect references, both from the past, from the present, and from the future. Uh, from the past, we collected some pieces from the archaeological museum and also from the present, for example, some of the mechanical gears that Ramiro had in his workshop or some quotes to the endless column by Brancusi. And the idea was to bring the past into the future and the future into the past to kind of uh, bring them together and create this series of stories that became columns in the exhibition space. So the, at the beginning, they were made uh, so in a prototype shape. So they were like a very small uh, models. And when we defined like the sequence of each of the stories, at the end, we made uh, seven different columns. Uh, then the pieces in the real size were produced and they were exhibited at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Oaxaca as well. Uh, it was a very interesting process because um, the narratives were also made collectively. And as you said, one of them was the story of the universe in a hundred years, and the other one was just the story in one day. So it also spoke about the, the notion of the daily life practice of how they collect the clay, how they prepare it, how the different forms were made, and also how this activity has been perhaps done already for more than 4,000 years. So they are gestures, not just objects, but also gestures that have stayed with us for so many, many, many years. Mm -hmm. What's typical for your work and what's already visible here is um, um, that you always have this kind of, um, that you're trying to find a way to use um, the specific material in connection to the cultural history, but also to, to still present um, text, techniques and um, yeah, cultural productions, which are still active by certain communities. And that's also the case, especially with this project. Yeah, this is something very important. The fact that um, each project has a very specific relationship with the with the material, so I'm very interested in craft and in learning these crafts. And the work always becomes something else when you learn these uh, different material techniques and when you share the time uh, of uh, developing a, a new work through this material experience. What we can also say by um, entering the next space is that the exhibition itself doesn't follow a chronological order. You might have seen that in the list of works already. And um, we decided uh, for that in relation, of course, to the spaces uh, we would like to show um, each of the work, but also because Mariana's um, interests are not also following just the chronological order of themes and subjects. And she of often also comes back to certain ideas like um, the idea of, of chance or um, the colonial history, uh, not only in Mexico, but um, also in other, other places. Um, and a new interest, um, or more recently, um, the, you developed a certain interest um, in, in the development or the process of, of evolution and the new work um, with the title, I mentioned it already once I thought the world was somewhere else, which has been adapted exactly to the space here at MGK Siegen, um, was developed in South Australia in a kind of desert area, the Edia Karan Hills, where archeological sites are yeah, just open, um, yeah, in a way for everybody in, 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 in an open land. And this um, area is researched um, through the museum, but also 
to um, scholars at the, at the local university. And you developed an interest um, in that uh, Idiakaran um, multicellular animals that have been found there and um, which are kind of resembled, uh, resembled jellyfishes. Um, so it's kind of a miracle already that the fossils are still there today or that, that there are fossils in a sense. Um, how did, did you discover um, um, this site and, and the story behind and what was the idea um, by developing this, this textile diorama we're now looking at? Yeah, the first time I heard about the diacarans was I was working on the first piece I did on evolutionary trees in Sao Paulo in Brazil. And I was talking with a paleontologist and we were trying to arrange all the different fossils in the right sequence. And then he showed me a fossil and he told me, this fossil, you cannot really place it on the evolutionary tree because there is so much discussion about where it can be placed. So we don't know if it's part of the mushrooms, we don't know if it's a plant, we don't know if it's an animal. So it's like a gambling element that has been jumping in the evolutionary tree uh, already for many, many years. And uh, so after a couple of years, I was invited to do an exhibition at the Monash University Museum in Melbourne. And then I remembered about these Ediacaran fossils. And then I, I started the whole project on a field uh, research trip to the Ediacara Hills, where I, uh, I could learn more about this very particular uh, moment in the history of life, let's say. And as in many other projects in the exhibition, uh, the Ediacarans are an example of a living form that is somehow out of the historical narrative. So you cannot really place it in one specific uh, location. And also it's, it's very strange that these very tiny living forms uh, managed to, to be maintained in, in stone and became fossils that we can now see with our open eyes when we walk through those landscapes. So this, uh, this project is uh, starting from a series of photographs I took on site. And they were printed in different kinds of textiles with different levels of transparency. Also thinking about how the, the fossils are made because when a, when one of these living forms lays down on the bottom of the ocean, and then there is maybe like a very thin um, bacteria uh, blanket that comes on top of it. And thanks to this very, very, very thin uh, cloth, it gets protected and then it becomes a fossil. So all these different layers and perforations, they are somehow uh, recovering both the landscape and also the material process of how a fossil uh, exists. Yeah, it also looks like a uh, kind of film strip, you know, a continuous photograph. I mean, you uh, told us it's several photographs, but they're kind of um, um, shown, presented in a kind of a filmic um, way. And at the same time, it's, it's kind of a creating kind of a labyrinth, um, which is not so visible here now on the in this in, in this documentation but which grabs um and and involves you in the whole setting by just walking through the different layers and um also having this uh, different um possibilities of perceptions because you also um you not only print it um on the textile but they are also cut outs you know, and doubled uh, double layers, like like these forms, which are um, yeah adding to the to the found stones and um, the forms created by the fossils themselves. Yeah, yeah, it's true that it has a cinematographic aspect. Also, in the way the 
a spectator can move around the space and look through these different uh, perforations with uh, colors and with transparencies. There's um, another space we might only introduce shortly. There's older work um, created during your time in Amsterdam, um, where you created an institute of chance and um, also a fictive um, protagonist who was sending out um, photographs from an anarchist archive that haven't been dedicated to certain events. There's um, also in that space um, a work still developed in Maastricht when you studied at the Jan van Eyck Academy, referencing to a text by Jorge Luis Borges, The Wall and Books, with exactly 987 words. And what you did, um, you can show that um, just shortly um, with close-ups of the copies that um, each of the works, yeah, go back. Each of the works have then be taken out or stolen from other books, 987 books, uh, in the library of the Maastricht Academy. So you will see that here on the screen that this end is referenced. To, this, uh, to the book number of the university library. Um, and maybe you can shortly explain, Mariana, what the interest was in the text and how it is related um, to deleting um, these words from other books. Um, uh, these two works, the Institute of Chance and the Wall and the Books, they, I think they represent a transition in my practice when at the beginning I was doing mainly book publications and artist uh, printed experiments. And in these uh, two works, I started to bring this into, uh, into the space. So it's not just the connection between one book and a certain text, but it's how you can connect, for example, one text with a whole library how you can, through a very uh, small act of vandalism, because at the end I erased almost 1,000 words from all these books in the library, how you can expand the practice, which is a practice based on, on the history of mail art and publications, but how it can become an action that expands into, into the space. And the Institute of Chance was also a similar strategy where I kind of, uh, I took these objects or these uh, photographs from the, from the archive and I sent them to people I didn't know in the city of Amsterdam. And I invented a fictional character that was telling a narrative and asking them to keep these photographs. So basically it's changing the original use of the documents and putting like a narrative on top and expanding them into a different space. We're now entering um, into space where we have this um, constellation of um, plaster prints. Um, and this work was developed in connection with the Ethnological Museum in Berlin Dahlem and part of the Berlin Biennale, um, I think, if I remember, in 2014. Um, I know you have been very much interested in the display of that um, plaster forms, but also about interested in the forms themselves because they made out of paper. And um, to have kind of a plaster form made of uh, out of paper um, seems from the first without the historic background, um, 
yeah, somehow strange or, or surprising um, because paper is such a um, yeah, unstable material in a way. But um, that was exactly the, the history you were interested in. And maybe you can tell us um, how you developed that installation and what brought you to that um, selection uh, which are now presented uh, presented on that um, metal shelves you created as well. Yeah, it was the first time I learned about uh, these paper molds was uh, at the British Museum when I was researching on Alfred Motsley, who was an explorer in the 19th century. And he went through the Maya region in Guatemala and Mexico and he wanted to make copies of many of the facades of the pyramids or all the other elements that he found. And if they would make it out of plaster, it was very heavy because they were like in the middle of the jungle and they needed to carry all these materials. So he invented this technique that was basically with papier mache and then they would put this mixture on top of the stone and then they would wait until it's dry. And then they will transport these paper forms back to Europe. And from these paper forms, they would make the plaster positives and then more negatives. So they could, they could continue this uh, reproduction technique. Uh, afterwards, they were using these reproductions also for academic purposes to be able to read the different uh, ornaments or to understand the scriptures that were engraved on stone. And for this work in specific, uh, it was done, as Thomas said, from paper forms that are now at the Ethnological Museum in Berlin. But now the negative forms are at the Gibbs for Marais, which is a workshop uh, part of the National Museums in Berlin that it's specialized in making plaster copies of many different archaeological and historical objects. And what is very beautiful, for example, about this uh, piece, which is a jaguar from Chichen Itza, is that you can still see the texture of the paper. So then you have like many different uh, materials on top of each other. First, you have the original stone that was uh, made. Then you have the paper that was used to make the mold. And then you have this new material, which is again, plaster that is used to make the positive. Um, so this, uh, all these pieces were installed in these metal racks, which are also inspired by the way they are kept on the museum storage. So it's a hybrid uh, display that it's trying to speak about what happens uh, behind the scenes in museums, because many of these copies are not considered a relevant material in museums because they are just reproductions or they are like secondhand uh, references to the original. But nowadays they became very important because some of the monuments, for example, they were eroded because of global warming. So you cannot see the inscriptions anymore or they were looted or they were taken to other museums and taken completely out of context. So all these copies that were made in the 19th century now are really, really important. So the museums are finally uh, paying attention to them and and trying to, to study them and keeping them more carefully. Just next to it um, is another work um, out of the same time, also referring to Alfred Motsley. Um, it's called Sumorph P. And uh, it's reference to a ceremonial stone monument um, in Guatemala. And um, it's also was called uh, the big turtle. And um, based on that um, story and uh, continuing also dealing with um, the scientists uh, techniques, um, you developed this wooden object um, that later on 
was um, the tool for making these prints we're seeing in the background. And um, maybe you can speak about um, the role of the object we're seeing here and um, what has been engraved by your, yourself and um, what was the translation or the importance of bringing the object on the paper again? Yeah, the, this uh, great turtle that Motley discovered, it's a massive uh, stone monument. It's uh, still there in Quirigua in Guatemala. And something that is very important in my work is this act of repetition. So many times, if I would read 2,000 essays about the meaning of the great turtle, I would have a very different understanding as if I repeat all these drawings and I make them myself. So it's another way of uh, understanding or learning. And in this case, it was an appropriation in the sense that I found uh, a wooden wood. So the shape was almost exactly like the one we see here. And I integrated all the original ornaments of the Solmorph key into this wooden piece and I engraved them. And I was also thinking like many times we speak about the trajectory of objects or where objects are going. So I was like, okay, I can probably make this object travel on paper and leave a trace. So I used it as a stamp, which is a, a tool to make the prints that we see on the back. So there are these kind of irregular uh, images that are going through the paper where you can actually recognize some of the ornaments of the somor. So it was somehow trying to let the, this big turtle walk again on paper. From Guatemala, we're coming back to the to the subject of um, uh, of the evolution of installation called pleasures of association and poisons such as love. I think originally developed for the uh, Sao Paulo Biennale in a large scale version, but also shown at Gallery Wedding um, several years ago, but it has been newly adapted um, to uh, one of the corner spaces of our building. And um, it's based on an evolutional tree, a diagram um, you discovered um, together or developed together with um, the curators and scientists at the Naturkunde Museum uh, in, in Berlin and uh, used it as a reference for this three-dimensional spatial bamboo structure um, that not only is a sculpture in itself but um, has also is a kind of um, yeah, a carrier of, of images, of, of portages, of, of prints made from fossils you found in the same collection of the museum and selected uh, together with the curators. Um, how this was developed and um, could you give an insight what, what were the the four size of forms you were interested in and um, brought you to, to that kind of technique, but also um, um, to this idea of a, of a structure. Yeah, talking about uh, reproduction techniques, uh, there was an anthropologist and archaeologist, Merle Robinson, who was working also in Guatemala and in Mexico for a long time. And she invented a technique to do uh, paper rubbings uh, with uh, liquid ink and to develop uh, frottages out of it. So there in this image, for example, you can see how it works. So usually you can do it also with charcoal, but in this case it's with uh, 
a special tool where you put like a very, very, very small uh, quantity of ink and then you scrub it on top of the on top of the paper and underneath you have the fossil. So then this uh, relief from the original fossil comes out. And uh, so this was the technique that I used to make all the all the rubbings and I contacted the Natural History Museum in Berlin and I wanted to make a, a small diagram of, uh, because the person we contacted at the beginning, Florian, he was an expert on amphibians. So he had a lot of knowledge about this transition between fish and birds. So I decided to make uh, one tree that would start from one of the first specimens that they had of a swimming, a uh, living form or a swimming uh, fish through one of the first um, flying dinosaurs, which is this uh, last image that we can see on the rubbing. And together with them, uh, I developed a diagram where you can see uh, reflected in this bamboo structure, which is from one side chronological and from the other side phylogenetic. So you see the connections between the different uh, elements, which is also in a floor as a kind of caption. So you can see and you can read uh, the correspondence of each fossil through the relation through the other uh, species. And then uh, basically each of these uh, paper sheets has a compilation of the of the fossils in-house that they have related to that specimen. But well, it's always very random. So sometimes it's just a tooth or sometimes it's like, I don't know, the ear or the mouth. Sometimes you can see a whole uh, living form, for example, with the turtles. So it really depends on the kind of uh, organism that you have. Uh, also, when they are vertebrates, is much easier because the fossil trace that they leave is much more consistent because of the bone structure. So this was also a easy uh, set of rubbings to do because they all have a very defined texture. And as uh, Thomas said, it was also specifically designed for this space at the museum in Siegen. We skip that um, installation. It's also again an imprint of um, um, a paper imprint of, of um, um, uh, wooden structure or, or tree structure. Um, also going back to the techniques of Alfred Mosley, and I would like to introduce you to the black space containing two series of works. Um, one is part of our museum's collection and has been acquired, first shown at Venice Biennial in 2011, later acquired by Eva Schmidt for the museum collection. Um, it's referring, this is long uh, vitrine and that goes together with the video you'll see. Um, and it's referring to the um, Borgia Codex, uh, stored in the in the Vatican uh, Library till today, and the second series called Falschgesichter is going back to German publications from 1953 um, with exotic masks. So the title was Exotische Masken, and um, it presented a collection of. Um, mask from different indigene uh, uh, cultures and um, also former colonies, so to say, which is some, sometimes visible in the translations. And as you can see, Mariana left the original out and just um, kept the, the legends or the, the image titles. Uh, and decided to represent the original mask that are that have been erased um, from that uh, paper um, into yeah abstract folded 
forms that uh, try to make a connection to the to the invisible object, so to say. Um, Mariana, what was um, the the interest in using this now almost seventy years old book? also reaching back to another period of time um, and develop this, um, this paper forms. Yeah, I found the book in a secondhand bookshop and it has this very dramatic black and white photographs of, uh, of uh, masks from different parts of the world. The title was already problematic because it's called exotic masks. And there is not so much information about them apart from this caption, which is written in French, in German, and in uh, English. So I decided to insist on this idea of projection on how are we giving out information through images and through text. So I left out the, the photograph and I just uh, kept these captions. And then I tried to follow the composition of the mask and to make it with the less uh, resources possible, which meant just uh, paper folds. So it's a sort of a wall that it's installed in the way of a bundakama. So you have all these uh, paper uh, folded pieces across the room. And they certainly give you an idea that they could be faces, but it's not something that it's immediately visible. And I thought it was also interesting in the context of how contemporary and modern art appropriated uh, ethnographic material uh, in abstract art or in other forms of, of expression and how I am using this material nowadays, how I am also working as a projection machine to try to translate this, uh, this material into a contemporary language. And this is the other work, which is called uh, The Where I Am is Vanishing. It's based on a Mesoamerican manuscript that it's now called Codex Borgia because it was uh, collected by the Cardinal Borgia who took it from Mexico to Italy. And it has the same format as the original and the same length, so it's a drawing that it has uh, is 10 meters long. But in this case, I told the story of the codex itself. So it's like a kind of meta document. And it starts with how a deer has been uh, sacrificed because the document is painted on deer skin and how the, the skin of this deer is open and how it is uh, put together and arranged in order to make this very large uh, stripe. And also how the painter starts to inscribe all these different calendaric informations that were afterwards used as an oracle, as a kind of calendar and ritual uh, tool. Afterwards, when it arrived to Europe, it was kept in a library for hundreds of years. So it was a very dark and lonely period for this document but it managed to meet other documents that were also stored there. And then it was started to be researched by a Jesuit uh, priest that spoke Nahuatl and who was coming from Mexico when all the Jesuits were expelled. So then there are like other voices that start to come in into the story. So there is uh, a part that it's uh, spoken in Nahuatl and also in Spanish. There is one which is in Italian. There is a section which is in German when uh, Humboldt also studied one of the pages. It's one of a very famous page from the codex where it's burned. So there is like the story that says that it was the children of Borgia who burned the codex by accident. I mean, not, it's a theory that it's not being confirmed, but this is one of the, of the theories. So all these different stories were collected and put into, into a film, which is the image that you see now on the left side. So 
So then the drawings are running across and then these different uh, voices are like playing on top of the, of the drawing. This is um, a space going back to a series of books. Um, um, developed and, and published together with uh, Brazilian designer Eugenio Hirsch. Um, the series is called El Mundo des, del Museos, um, The World of Museums, and it's bringing um, different collection from uh, Gemälde Galerie in Dresden to uh, the National Gallery in London um, and other museums. Um, brings these collections into this books and um, uses. You can see that um, in the details, um, bringing um, uh, the, the images you discover in the book uh, in relation to the potential viewers or, or visitors. So also kind of transformation, bringing an exhibition into a book and giving an insight into local collection. Mariana, you're showing um, the books in a way that they are constantly open up in a, in a um, defined angle. Um, and you also um, punish the books in a way that um, we look can look through the different layers, um, something we discovered already in another space as a kind of technique. Um, but also um, taking away the information of the images we see as well as um, yeah, interfering with that kind of graphic uh, and, and visual language that is developed for these books. Um, I would be interested in um, how you came up with this forms and um, uh, this idea of not only presenting the collection and series of books uh, you're showing, but doing it in that way we are now experiencing it in, in the space. And maybe also speaking about the, the, the color you have chosen for the space as well. Yeah, the first uh, book I found of this collection was in Antwerp when I did an exhibition there at Objective. And I was very amazed that the photographic uh, material of the book is very impressive because it starts to really go into how people experience museums. So it was not so much about the pieces which are in the museum, but how people are looking at the artworks, how they are moving around the spaces. And then there was this double page, like the one you have now there, where there is the, like some of the artworks in this museum and there's always like a small figure, a human figure on scale that shows like a comparison of the dimensions of these artworks in the real space. And then I started to collect more of the books from this series. I found them also on secondhand uh, bookshops and I discovered that in each of these books they made a different collage. So I thought that this was amazing. Um, there's always a small note there on the collage where it says that here you can see the relationship on scale of some of the artworks in the museum uh, in comparison to a human. Um, but then I started to do this experiment, so drilling the books, like you say, pun punishing them. But I had always in mind that this drilling of the books, it was also a kind of homage to the spectator, to the viewer, because Many times we let all these people come into the museums, but there is no way to know how their experience was, like what's the kind of trace that they leave in the museum. So this was a sort of metaphor of how the ghostly trace of the spectator somehow stays uh, in the museum rooms. So for each of these books, uh, there is a different motive that it's more or less int intuitively uh, perforated into the book. 
And then when I started to exhibit them in series, like we see now with this uh, wooden uh, bases as well, I started to experiment with the background colors to make a more of a three-dimensional uh, effect. And also that this perforation became much more visible through the space and became also part of the architecture. Yeah, which brings us already to the new wing of MGK Siegen and the uh, last two spaces where we can just um, give, give partly an insight, but we're coming back to the to the well-known and, and large uh, spatial work, uh, the Nuremberg map of Tenochtitlan, and which has a very interesting story behind. Um, we should say that um, visitors can um, walk on that pavement, which is engraved um, with several millimeters so the whole space becomes kind of a, a printing plate, a wooden uh, a woodcut, a large scale woodcut, which also builds an overlay um, with our architecture. So the, the map you're seeing is just uh, in, the, in the right, um, in the first space, continues in the second space. So the map is overlay, uh, overlaying our um, floor plan and architecture, um, but also differs to kind of maps from uh, from a city map to kind of coastal um, orientation map in the second space. Um, I know you were very much intrigued by um, how um, this map came to Europe and um, why it was so important and well distributed at that time. Um, so maybe you can um, take us back in, 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 uh, in the discovery of that story behind that map and what it, uh, what it meant um, uh, for your further research and um, the de development of that costumes also we're seeing uh, installed on that large scale map um, that takes over the two spaces of the new wing of the museum. Yeah, the, the map is called the map of Nuremberg Tenochtitlan, which is also a very strange title for such an image. So I was always wondering what was the relationship between this image and Germany. And it was because uh, in Germany and especially in Nuremberg, they had like the most uh, important so printing uh, areas in Europe. So this drawing was first made in Mexico by an indigenous painter. And then it was integrated into the letter that Hernán Cortés wrote to the King of Spain. It was the second letter that he sent because the, fir the first one got lost. And in the second letter, he explains that it's worthy uh, conquering this land because it has so many resources, because this city is so spectacular and it has water and it has uh, natural resources. So this letter was sent um, to Nuremberg uh, together with a drawing and this drawing was converted into a woodcut. So that's why it looks like a typical medieval image uh, from the time. So I am very interested in how this image experienced so many different transitions and also that it was the first image that was uh, more uh, distributed in Europe about what the city could look like uh, the, at that time, Mexico, Tenochtitlan, and now it's what we know as uh, Mexico City. And um, well, as Thomas said also, this is on itself a printing plate. So the first time that I exhibited this work, I also used it as a, as a printing matrix. So there is a book that it's uh, the printing edition of this floor map. 
And it was also used as a kind of display of the costumes that you see there. They are chinelo costumes. Uh, they are carnival costumes made in the state of Morelos. And uh, they are also a parody of the Spanish uh, carnival parties. So when the indigenous people couldn't participate into the carnival celebrations, they made their parallel and parodic version of the carnival. So in this case, I, it was at the beginning a performance that I did in Matadero in Madrid with a group of chinelo dancers and there was also a band playing along. And the second time that I presented this work, it was more as a display structure. So these uh, different elements were more like floating in space, but they were not uh, part of a performatic situation. But the floor was the thing that was keeping them alive, let's say, because the spectators can walk through the floor and then they can also encounter these images uh, on scale. And this is a work that is not yet in the exhibition, where it will come to the exhibition as soon as the museum can open. I found it uh, in August when I was here in Siegen doing research at the local uh, museum. I didn't know that Rubens was born in Siegen. I was very impressed by it. Uh, I love his paintings, but I really, really find his etchings incredible. And I also discovered here in Siegen that he had a special workshop where there were people that making reproductions of his paintings into etchings. So this version of, of his painting of the Amazon sacrifice uh, was done by Lucas Fostermann. I also find it very, very interesting that he gives a different credit to his paintings and to the person who is actually doing the etchings, the reproductions of his paintings. And it's a very large etching for the time. It's made also out of six different prints, uh, which makes also a connection to the floor piece because the floor piece is also made out of different uh, wooden panels. Uh, so well, this work will come to the exhibition very soon and it will be also in that room, but now we just have it here as, a, as part of the slide show. Yeah, it's maybe, uh, it's, it's basically for um, pragmatic reasons that we, we can show the, the work because it's on paper for about two months in, in light and we, we want to have it for the very last moment. Um, to make use of it as long as possible. And um, yeah, that's um, somehow the, the end of the, of the walkthrough and, and overview of the exhibition. I will shortly stop the presentation. So we have more to see and um, Maybe one last word, Mariana, to the work that is still in development about the Taufschale I've mentioned. Um, we took the time because um, we had very recent information about um, its use and context, but it was also a discovery of, of your research. And um, for me personally, I also, um, read more about the history of the uh, Taufschale, also from a PhD written in, in the 50s by Friedrich Mutmann, um, which, which tells already a lot about that relation between the continents, but also the relation, the formal relation to European and uh, Mesoamerican um, art history and techniques. And yeah, after, after going through that exhibition and the different works uh, like the, the Codex Borgia, I, I, I think it's clear why it, it, it's grab, grabbing your interest as well, but um, without showing the, the piece, which is still developed and later installed, um, 
maybe you can give us an insight about uh, your interest in that object uh, and, and story and what we might can expect from you. It's a very intriguing piece because it's a baptized uh, vessel made out of silver. And on the edge, it has a series of ornaments that when, when you look at them from far, you're like, yeah, okay, they're just like European drawings, something related to, I don't know, to the Bible perhaps. But then when you start to look closer, you realize that there are all these animals and they're like, okay, maybe they're fantastic animals that they don't exist. But then you start to identify it looks like a llama or it starts to look like different uh, ornaments and figures that resemble uh, Peruvian uh, indigenous art. So that's when you start to understand that it was basically done in Peru by a group of uh, craftsmen. It was probably, an order from, from this uh, king or from someone that wanted to, to make a present as a diplomatic exchange for slaves or for goods. So that's when I became very, very interested in it. And then as Thomas said, we started to investigate more and we realized that this object had gone like all over the world. It was first made in Peru and then it was in Brazil and it was also in Africa and then finally arrived to see where it has been uh, hosted in the local church, in the Moritz church already for a very long time. And now it's going to be part of uh, an exhibition at the Rijksmuseum about slavery because it's such an important example of how these objects were part of the uh, slave and goods trade during the colonial site. And um, another interesting aspect is that because the object will go from the church to the Rijksmuseum, the church wanted to make a replica of it. So they started doing a digital copy. So they made a 3D scan that is also accessible online where you can see like all these different views of the object and probably they will make a silver replica. So it again uh, talks about this reproduction of the objects in different uh, moments and in different materials and now in the digital form that it's something that it's uh, becoming more and more relevant uh, in museum collections, this idea of digitalizing the object that is also an, an interesting discussion. And well, the work will be will be installed after Rubens uh, etching from Lucas Forsterman comes down. So we will keep you informed when all these different uh, surprises in the exhibition start to happen. Yeah, thank you very much, Mariana, for this um, extensive insight um, and um, the information you gave us about your working process and, and uh, the subject and interests uh, behind it. And um, yeah, maybe um, we make a point here. I mean, there's much more program to come like lectures and uh, also we're producing um, a new version, a new edition of uh, Schiebla, a scientific artistic journal, uh, Mariana, um, is yeah, publishing uh, since 2013 already, and which is giving, which is not a catalog of the show, but um, through contributions by several authors and people that appear also in the lecture program in the coming months, um, gives a further insight in your artistic research. Um, and that is also done um, just because I had a look on our um, participants of, of this artist talk um, in collaboration with MUAC, uh, Museo Universitario Arte Contemporaneo in Mexico, and uh, Artium, uh, Centro Museo Vasco de Arte Contemporaneo de Vitoria Gasteis in Spain. And um, more information about that to come, but we want and would like to allow you for questions uh, you like to pose to Mariana directly uh, and would have the chance to stand a little bit, a couple of minutes more 
to answer your question. So the stage now is yours. Please raise the hand or type in your questions into the chat and we try to answer 